Hi, good morning, and welcome to Grand Rounds on this balmy winter day. Um, this is our last Grand Rounds of the fall semester, and it's our tradition to highlight some of the wonderful work we do in quality um, at least once a year. And I think everyone in the audience will know uh, the driver for the wonderful work that we do is Amy Rosenberg, the Associate Chair of Administrative Affairs in the department. And Amy is just such a wonderful uh, source of information and inspiration for all of us. And you've heard me say before, there's many ways to think about quality and many things of which we should be proud. What I'm most proud of is that we do quality work everywhere we do work. There's not a single site, there's not a single space where Amy is not championing quality for our patients and for ourselves. And the other thing I always like people to remember with quality, it is about the work. It's about thinking about doing things differently or thinking about working towards different outcomes. But it also is such an important way for us to work together and to build teamwork and to build companionship and collaboration amongst ourselves. And when that's literature will tell us that in many instances, that's the most important piece of quality work is that teamwork that develops and so when I think about the quality council we have in the department and the great roundtables we have monthly with that group, that's an example of the kind of teamwork that goes on. So today we have two presenters in addition to Amy. We have Shinoy, uh, Dr. Shantiri Shinoy uh, from hospital medicine as well as the renal division. Uh, Shantiri trained um, in nephrology and then came back to us first as a hospitalist. But important for all of you to know, she's also doing nephrology consults now and has really been a great champion in quality and just a great member of our department in some theory. We love working with you and love having you here today to highlight your work. The other person is Dr. Navia Casely Hayford. I think probably everyone in the audience knows Navia. She's been with us a somewhat long time, does most of her primary care work on the 147th Street site, but also is the medical director for the hospital clinics at Mount Sinai St. Luke's. And Navia is a great friend to the department, a really a great example for me of what primary care should look like in the 21st century. And Navia and I have had the opportunity to work quite closely together in the last few years. And Navia, we're really proud of you and really delighted to have you here today. Amy? Okay, thank you all very much for coming to our second uh, Grand Rounds uh, that involves QI for our department. So um, I'm going to be, okay, so better. Okay, so I'm going to be um, giving a very brief update of some things that are going on in quality in the Department of Medicine here. And then as, um, as Dr. Seward said, you're going to hear from Dr. Shinoy and Dr. Kaisley Hayford. Okay, so um, I just want to remind you that we are part of a system, Department of Medicine quality structure, so we work very closely with our colleagues at BI and Mount Sinai Hospital uh, to determine best practices and um, to share them across the system. Our goal for the future is to have a quality project that all of our, um, that, that each division does with all of the hospitals. And we'll be talking about more of that in the future. So I showed this slide last year. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but I just want to um, point you into the right side of the screen into our proactive priorities. So um, that's where we really want to be. So we're not just reacting, but we're proactive in how we approach QI. So you're going to be hearing about the divisional projects, um, as you know. And also, it's important for us um, as a hospital and as a system to develop a culture of safety. So quite incidentally, uh, we, I want to just briefly mention the safety net incident reporting. Um, and I know the House staff got an email about that uh, last night from Dr. Andrilli explaining what it is. And you should have gotten um, several emails over the past couple of weeks about the safety net. So I just want to briefly talk about it. It's the new electronic reporting system across Mount Sinai Health System. So here at our two hospitals, we used to have those paper forms and the house staff are probably familiar with them. Like if somebody fell, you just sign them and the nurses would take them um, and you know they'd fax them off somewhere and you never knew anything about what happened after that. So all those paper forms, we're getting rid of those and this is a very easy electronic system to report things that you see. So. Um, you know, and if you're a house staff and if anybody wants to see uh, 
a little brief list of things that um, can be reported. Um, I'm happy to give that to you. But basically, uh, it's any unintended incident, act, or omission that could have or did result in harm, damage, or loss to patients, but also staff, visitors, and the public or to the organization. Um, so basically, it's anything that you think could have been done better. Um, and it's also really a safe place to report errors. You can report anonymously, um, so you don't have to give your name when you do the electronic report. Um, because and obviously the reason we want to see these reports is because we want to learn about what's happening so we can implement safety solutions. And also since it's being done electronically, it'll be easier for us to um, gather the data and see in what areas we need to work on. So not just an individual incident, but are there 10 or more or two or more um, examples of something we could do better with. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Dr. Seward, just asked me how you access it. So, first of all, um, there is training in PEAK, um, and it's in all those emails. So, you access it through the um, desktop launcher. So, it's right near Epic, and it looks like that little icon on the bottom there. This, I don't know, I can't get to it, but this um, safety net thing on the bottom right of the slide, it looks just like that. Um, you can also get to it through the intranet, so you just go to either the St. Luke's or the West intranet pages and it's on the left side under health system links. Um, they also said that you're going to be able to access it through Epic, but I ha I've looked for it there, I haven't found it. I think the best way is just to go to the um, desktop launcher. Okay, so I want to remind you that uh, the Department of Medicine, on to a different topic, the Department of Medicine has a, a quality council, we meet monthly, and each division has a quality champion and we discuss our QI projects there. So uh, the last time we met, which was in 2018, we had Dr. Tina Park uh, for GI and Dr. El Hashem for renal, who spoke to us. And today, um, you know who's speaking, Dr. Casey Hayford and Dr. Shinoy. And also I just want to point out that Dr. Shapiro is the quality champion for pulmonary critical care. I think most people know her. And I wanted just to point out that we have four new uh, divisional quality champions since we last met. So Dr. Ch Jessica Patel, um, who's over there, and I'm going to make her stand she or raise her hand. So she is for rheumatology. Um, Dr. Rahul Agarwal, who I believe is on vacation, he's for endocrine. Dr. Rahul Gaikwad, who's for infectious diseases and is in our audience over there. And Dr. Faye Reeve Passaru, who um, is the Associate Chief for Hospital Medicine at Mount Sinai St. Luke's, and she is for that division. So we're very excited to have um, all these great um, people working with us, and they've already hit the ground running. Okay, so that's my little um, bit, and I want to get right to the heart of the matter. So I'm going to just introduce uh, Dr. Shinoy again. So she's an assistant professor. Um, so as you know, she's a nephrologist. Um, and I'm very happy to report that she recently graduated from the Greater New York Clinical Quality Fellowship Program. This is a very prestigious um, program, and she's been able to take what she's learned from there and really apply it to um, her QI projects. She is a member of uh, the West Hospital Root Cause Analysis Committee, so she um, actually uh, it does uh, lead the root causes, and so she helps to come up with safety solutions for some of the cases in the hospital. And she oversees all mortality reviews for the West Hospital Medicine Division, and she chairs the, their m and committee. So she really does a lot with quality, and you know I've known uh, Dr. Shinoy for, I, I guess, three going on four years now, and it's been an absolute pleasure to see her grow and her enthusiasm for quality, and it really has become her passion. So it's, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Shinoy. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg and Dr. Sewell for the kind introduction, and good morning, everyone. Um, without wasting much time, I'm just going to start with the project. So um, our hospital medicine QI projects are either based on uh, high value care or patient safety. We have, um, um, so to start with, I'll start with the deep prescribing docacy project. So as you all know, the tradition has been when patients need laxatives to go for something like docacy, which is a stool softener. Um, you know, the, the, the culture of prescribing docacet is based on observational studies before the 1960s um, when, you know, the attendings wrote um, prescribed docacet and that was passed on to the trainees. 
But after 1960, there have been several randomized controlled trials um, looking at docosate versus placebo. And uh, all these studies showed that there was no, no real difference in um, frequency of bowel movements um, or even you know, stool volume, stool water content in inpatients. So to summarize, um, docosate really does not add um, much to patient care. It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing, increasing you know, um, as a laxative. It also adds um, um, cost for drug, labor costs in terms of nursing hours, pharmacy hours. Um, this is a study from McGill University that was published in JAMA. So what they really did was they looked at um, um, the cost for docosate in 2015. They looked at the total number of pills prescribed, um, took into account nursing hours, um, pharmacy hours, and for around um, 165,000 doses that were prescribed in 2015 on a med surge floor, um, the total cost were around $60,000. Um, so really you're prescribing something that's expensive, not cost effective, and not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, to summarize this tweet, I think, does justice um, from Journal of Hospital Medicine. Basically, you should de-prescribe docosate because you're um, adding to pill burden, increasing nursing hours, pharmacy costs. Um, and also, sometimes patient, uh, patients report um, an altered taste, and it can also affect um, absorption of other medications. So um, when there is a when you have the chance, de-prescribe docosate and um, order alternative agents like um, Neurolax or lactose. Um, to see what the culture of prescribing at our institution was, we did a, a brief resident survey um, before we actually started the project. And um, one of the questions we asked was, who do you prescribe laxatives for? And um, majority of the PG, PGY1s and PGY2s felt that they prescribe it for all elderly patients. Um, and uh, what was their go-to medication? What did you um, prescribed first, and almost close to 50% of them felt that the fir their first choice was docosate and Senna. Um, so now that we knew what the prescribing trend was, um, we did our interventions based on that. Um, most of them were educational. Um, GI and pharmacy worked uh, very closely with us on this project, and um, we did noon conference for the house staff, did um, you know, frequent reminders for high utilizers. We got EPIC reports on who were who was actually prescribing more. Um, and um, also, as you know, educational interventions are not sustainable. So we did some EMR changes. So now, if you try to order docosate on the on EPIC, uh, when you type in docosate, you de your screen defaults to this um, bowel inpatient regimen, just like a like your um, diabetic agents. So when you type in metformin, you go to diabetic agents uh, or reset. So, and uh, when you click on the bowel agents inpatient um, order set, you see that the preferred inpatient bowel regimen is Miralax, and um, and Doxate is listed under the alternative or less preferred regimen. For those of you who want to still go with Doxate, there's another high value care reminder which says, you know. Um, that, the, that it's not recommended. Um, so after all these interventions, as you can see, there's a steady decline. What you see in red is um, the number of um, pills prescribed per month of docosate, and what you see in blue is the polyethylene glycol prescriptions per month. So since 2018 is when we really started this project, you see a steady decline in the number of uh, pills ordered and an increase in the um, in the um, orders for polyethylene glycol. Um, this was um, presented by one of our residents then, Dr. Varheyan, who's now a GI fellow here at ACG, and he won the Outstanding Presenter Award. So, um, so the next project is also a um, high-value care project, which is um, reducing inpatient folate testing. We started this project in um, 2017, and our goal at that point was to decrease the inpatient folate testing by 20%, and then, you know, we carried out on to uh, 2018 um, to decrease the, uh, with the target of decreasing uh, folate orders in inpatients at Mount Sinai West by 50%. This is, again, based on a ABIM choosing wisely recommendation to not order folate levels. Um, you know, since 1998, when uh, FDA a mandated fortifying food with folic acid, um, we barely see any folate deficiencies. 
um, it's seen in less than 1% of patients tested for folic acid. And, um, you know, it's, it's really cost effective to supplement folate pills than testing for folic acid. Um, so in 2015 and 2016, this was our baseline data, there was uh, 2,500 folate tests ordered at Mount Sinai West. And how many of them were really abnormal? Less than 2%. Um, and how many of them really changed management? So we did a chart review of patients of the of the abnormal folates and saw if you know this fo abnormal folate level was actually acknowledged and if people did anything about it. By anything about it, I mean did people add did were prescribers you know supplementing folate or was this was this result really acknowledged? And um, it was acknowledged only in 37% of the cases. So the rest of them there was an abnormal folate, but really nothing was done about it. Um, Interventions were, again, noon conferences, targeted feedback. Also, during one of our PDSA cycles, we noticed that um, a lot of ordering was from psychiatry and addiction medicine. It was part of their order set for admissions. They routinely ordered folate and B12 levels. So we did, um, we did um, um, kind of a noon conference with them and sent targeted emails. Um, the EMR intervention is something that we actually borrowed from the Mount Sinai Hospital when we went live with EPIC. So... As you can see, there is when you know you you try to order folate, there is a little high value care committee reminder to not order folate. Um, so this is the trend in ordering folate. This is the number of folate tests ordered at Mount Sinai West um, from 2017, um, and you know I just ran a report from um, J January of 2019, and I was just told that there was nothing ordered after May of 2019. So that, you know, and we haven't done any intervention since the beginning of January or, or, or the fall of 2018. So it looks like the culture has changed and it's it seems to be like a sustainable change without any, any intervention. Um, this is just a quick overview. We presented this at the SHM um, in the spring and we did a quick um, cost analysis. So cost of each folate test is approximately $77. This is taking into account the cost of the test and then the labor cost from the lab, whereas the cost of one milligram of folic acid tablet is less than 10 cents. Um, so if you do a little cost analysis here, the CMI for that year was around 3.83 days, and total cost um, of just giving folic acid tablets for those 2,500 patients that we tested in 2015 and 2016 would have just been $700. Um, um, so the next project is based on patient safety, and this is something that I'm very passionate about, and um, you know, this was my capstone for um, my fellowship as well. Um, basically, this, what this project focused on is improving medication error reporting among residents, physician assistants, and hospitalists at Mount Sinai West Medicine. A little bit of background, um, you know, medication error is defined as an error occurring in the medication use process. Uh, Institute of Medicine estimated that medication errors um, occur in uh, approximately one in one, uh, you know, cause one in 131 outpatient deaths and around one in 854 inpatient deaths. Um, and prescribing errors for inpatients happen at least 12.3 times per thousand patient admissions, which I think is a significant number. Um, and several studies have shown physicians to be historically under reporters of adverse events. We tend to report events that would have that have ended up in patient harm or death or near death, as opposed to nurses, and they have a culture to report anything that could lead to harm. You know, not even if it has not caused any harm, if they think there is a potential for harm, they tend to report. And this has been shown in several studies. Um, before the project, before implementing the project, um, we wanted to see what the barriers for reporting were. Um, and one of the things that we came across was nobody knew that there was a portal to even report. Um, so um, we did a, um, um, a patient safety uh, survey of the residents and PAs. Um, it was based on the HRQ patient safety survey with 10 questionnaires, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to go over two of them. Uh, the, one of the things was, um, 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 are you aware of an electronic medication error reporting system in the hospital? And more than 80% were not aware of it. This is before the project. Um, and then the second one we asked was, 
which was kind of reassuring, is how comfortable do they feel to speak up if they see something that may negatively affect patient care. And almost 50% of them felt that they did feel comfortable to speak up, which I think was reassuring for all of us. Um, so our baseline was the total number of medication errors reported um, at West in 2017. There were um, around 94 reports. Um, around two-thirds of them were from the pharmacists. Uh, the rest from the nurses and physicians and PAs reported none. Um, our interventions, we, had, we did several PDSA cycle. We used Quantify, um, which is which was an uh, which is an which was an error reporting system. Now that we have Safety Net, um, to to use um, to promote reporting. Um, so there were several challenges for this because Quantify is really an outside vendor, so we had to really work very closely with them to get everybody a group sign-in or an individual sign-in. Even um, you know, educating people about what to report. You know, you don't you don't really need to re you don't need to wait for harm to be done to report if you see a potential for harm. If you're trying to order Lasix on on a particular patient, and because you have four charts open in Epic, you ordered it on the wrong patient, you still can report that because we can fix that in the system. Um, here's a little bit of data on what, uh, how many reports we got from hospitalists, PAs, and residents from January to August of 2019 this year. Um, I think going from zero to almost 18 is so kind of significant. Um, I want to hi highlight um, the post-intervention survey where we asked, we did the survey again of PGY1s and PGY3s and PGY2s and 3s and uh, PAs on if they were aware of an electronic error med uh, medication error reporting system and most of them felt yes, this was a reverse from what the pre-intervention survey was. Um, I want to highlight two of the um, errors that were reported and that led to significant changes in EPIC and um, these were reported by um, two of our residents, Dr. Espinoza, who probably here is one of the chiefs, and uh, Dr. Anand, they reported this in Quantify and we were able to um, debrief, um, work with pharmacy and get these changes done in EPIC. So one of the errors was, um, you know, patients would be on sub-Q heparin or Lovenox for DVT prophylaxis. And at a later date, when you do a medication reconciliation, if the patient was on Coumadin or Doac and you started on them, um, there was no, you know, there were several instances where patients would be on dual anticoagulation. As you can see now, if you try to order a Pixaban and if the patient is already on sub-Q heparin, there is a BPA which shows up saying patient is already on one of the anticoagulants. So, you know, um, it, you know, there, it, it may lead to a little bit of alert fatigue and BPA fatigue, but I think it's good to have a system reminder that, you know, you can, um, that can remind providers. The other one was um, uh, an instance where patient, um, a type, type 1 diabetic did not get insulin um, at night because the patient was NPO. Um, there, was, there was a gap in communication between the providers and the nurses. So now when you try to order Lantus, uh, long-acting insulin, there is a reminder. Um, it, it shows up under the admin, admin, administration instructions to not hold, uh, um, even if the patient is NPO for a type 1 diabetic, to reach out to the, to the uh, physicians. Um, our last project is um, reducing labs in observation unit at Mount Sinai West. Um, you know, this is, this, um, is an ongoing project. Um, basically, you know, observation unit, as all of you know, is really meant to be a 24 to 48 hour length of stay. Um, excessive labs in the observation unit leads to increased length of stay, decreased patient, patient satisfaction because of phlebotomy, um, and also lack of adequate follow-up because often these patients are discharged and you may get an abnormal lab and who's following it and who's following these patients back. Um, our interventions were mainly educational to the hospitalists and PAs um, and targeted feedback with frequent reminder emails. Um, what you see here in blue is the, uh, the number of CBC orders in 2018. Um, and with our interventions, we were able to bring, it, bring the number of orders in 2019 down. Also, um, the volume of patients in the observation unit in 2019 is much higher. So I think this is a significant difference. Um, and this is um, just the chemistry orders from 2018 and 2019. Um, our other ongoing project is um, 
reducing utilization of IV hydralazine um, in labirol for management of asymptomatic hypertension. Um, and this, this project was a result of one of our M&Ms where we had an adverse outcome. So this is something that we're still working on. Like any questions? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shinoy. That was fabulous. Okay, so um, next uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Casey Hayford. Uh, Dr. Casey Hayford um, has been with us for quite a long time, and, and we love her. But anyway, she uh, initially, several years ago, was the medical director for what was then called Primary Care Internal Medicine Resident Clinic. That's when it was at the hospitals and not at Ryan. Um, and she's really been a QI leader for uh, chronic conditions uh, for many years, including diabetes, and has led uh, multiple projects and initiatives. Um, she, since 2012, she's done sort of the same for the hospital. She's been the medical director of ambulatory care at both hospitals um, and uh, has been the medical director at employee health and was um, very um, wonderfully stepped in as the division chief for her division uh, over the past year before um, Dr. Carnavali came. Um, and uh, most importantly, she in 2015, she won the Distinguished Young Physician of the Year Award for Luke's Roosevelt Hospital Alumni Association, and um, I think that just shows uh, how great, how much, uh, how much importance she has um, been to the hospitals, and um, what a great um, team player she is. So. There <laughs> <laughs> she is. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Casey. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are doing in the Division of General Internal Medicine. Um, so I'm going to start off with, we have about four primary care practices, all located on the west side, as you can see, from 147th Street all the way down to 83rd Street. Um, this is sort of what our overview of our primary care practices look like, and this is what our PAM mix is. Our PAM mix is shifting a little bit, and I put in the red arrows um, so you can see that Medicaid is coming down. We are increasing our commercial. Um, some practices have a little more Medicare. Um, than others. Um, the primary care team has uh, become a little more robust. We've added RNs and Ps, um, social workers um, over the past year. And then at the bottom is some of the other staff we use in terms of our multidisciplinary teams. So the Division of General Internal Medicine normally has key um, adult care key indicators that we work on over the year. And these are system-wide measures chosen by the Primary Care Institute and MS Mount Sinai Health Partners. And they're sort of based out of the um, Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act of 2015. And under that comes um, MIPS measures, which is a merit incentive payment system. So primary care is shifting more to value-based care versus um, just sort of um, fee-for-service. Um, yeah. So basically what happens is that there's a discussion and they pick some of the measures. If you're doing well in certain measures, um, other measures should have picked. So for 2019, there were two new measures that were added. I put in yellow, highlighted in yellow. So colorectal cancer screening and controlling high blood pressure. And then 2018, those are benchmark target rates. And as you can see, the benchmark target rate went up a little bit in 2019. Um, so basically, to be able to do any QI process, you sort of have to define the process. So we define the steps in our QI process. We normally define the roles of our providers, staff, and patients. We develop our QI workflow. And we've been using Epic a lot to standardize, structure our QI process and interventions. Um, and one of the big issues is sort of our data, because we get data from all sorts of places. We get Epic reports, we have quality scorecards, we get 360 reports, we have patient level reports. So sometimes it makes it a little challenging to be working with so many um, data points. We also work very hard on multidisciplinary team engagement for all staff at prim in primary care. And the most important things we do are the plan, the PDSA cycle. So for each of these steps, we are consistently doing PDSA cycles to test out our interventions. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is depression screening. Um, this is basically any patient aged 18 and older. Uh, we screen annually uh, for depression screening, or pretty much at every visit. So as you can see, we are above our target rate for depression screening for this year. So baseline data for 2018, we had an 88.8%. .8%. 
the target rate was 75%. This year, we're um, at a 50, 85% on November 2018. So some of the interventions we do is that we work a lot with our medical assistants in primary care. So the medical assistants are trained to screen the patients for depression just using the PHQ-2 and EPIC. And they are also taught to document in the right field. Because if you don't document in the right field in EPIC, when the report is run, you wouldn't know that the patient was screened. And then the providers are educated to complete the PHQ-9 if there's a positive screen, discuss medication management, or refer to site. Um, we've added a social worker from collaborative care who specializes in psychotherapy for depression. She's at two of our practices at 147th and, 10, and 1090 now, 91st Street. So some of the challenges, um, as I mentioned, is that making sure people document in the right field in EPIC, we did have a turnover of providers and MAs at the practices, so we're training the new providers on, on the workflow and basically standardizing training for the MAs across the practices. Um, the next two are cancer screening. So we're doing breast cancer screening. As you can see, we're below the target rate. And for colorectal cancer screening, we're also below the target rate. So for breast cancer screening for December 2018, we were still below the target rate of 61.8%. The target rate has gone up a little bit to 72%. Currently, we're a little better than last year. We're at 63.6%. The other thing we're adding now is claims data, because if a patient has a mammogram done outside the system, sometimes it's very difficult to... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sometimes it's very difficult to... Um, get the report. So we started adding claims data. The problem with claims data is that there's a lag time. Sometimes there's sort of a three-month lag time of getting um, getting the reports. For colorectal cancer screening also, our baseline last year was 59.6%. Target rate is 70%. We're a little below the baseline um, how we're doing last year. We had a 57.1%. But again, if you add claims data of people who've gone outside the system and done uh, colorectal cancer screening, we had about a 58%. So some of our main thing with um, colorectal and breast cancer screening is that you have to have the reports in hand for it to count. If, if the patient says they did it, but you don't have the report, it doesn't count. So some of the interventions for breast cancer screening, the MAs do pre-visit planning. So they check the system. Epic, if the mammogram hasn't been done, they pen the mammogram order, send it to the provider in a telephone counter um, to sign the mammogram. Patients generally can be scheduled for mammogram appointments with radiology. We started using a mammogram van. Mammogram van, again, is just a two sites, 147th and um, 91st Street. So that has really helped a lot of the women because it's sort of easy to just go in your neighborhood, you know, get into the mammogram van, have your mammogram down, and then we get the results from the mammogram van. And then the other thing is education, the providers to discuss breast cancer screening with patients. Colorectal cancer screening, again, pre-visit planning is done by a medical assistant. If the colorectal cancer screen hasn't been done, they pen an order most of the time for colonoscopy for the providers to discuss with the patients at the visit. The patient meets what we call criteria to schedule a direct colonoscopy, so we have a template in EPIC that you can just fill. Um, we will send the completed colonoscopy referral to the GI referral coordinator, and they will contact the patient directly to just schedule the colonoscopy. So the patient doesn't have to be seen by GI if they meet the criteria for direct colonoscopy. If the patient, most of the time, refuses to have a colonoscopy, then they would pen a fit kit, or we're using colibri tests now, and then that will be provided by the uh, placed by the provider. Fit kits can be mailed, or they can be given at the office visit. The colibri kits are actually mailed directly from the company to, to the patient. And then the other intervention we did was also educating providers to discuss a colon cancer screening with patients. So some of our challenges uh, with colorectal cancer screening, educating providers. Again, the guidelines are a little different. We use the U.S. Preventive Task Force guidelines. There's also the American Cancer Screening, um, Society Screening Guidelines, which are a little different. Um, again, we had some turnover of providers and MAs, so educating the new providers and MAs on workflows. Patients refuse to have mammograms, they refuse to have colonoscopies, they don't return their fit kits, they don't return their color guard tests. And lately we've been discovering that the color guard instructions are really complicated for some patients. So they either bring in the boxes into the practice and like, I can't do this, how do I do this? And discovering that the booklet, is, you know, it's a pretty thick booklet. So some of them decide they don't want to do the color guard and will do the fit kit, or they're sending in the color guard test with insufficient 
or inappropriate collection of stools. So we're getting sort of these empty um, readings of readings not done. So we're sort of working on ways to either simplify the instructions for the cold guard so that the patients feel more comfortable using them. The other thing is following up of no-shows. A lot of patients may schedule the appointment and then they don't show up for the appointment. I had a patient who no-showed her colonoscopy, I think, three times. So the referral coordinator got upset. So finally, the patient came into the office and I'm like, why aren't you going? Keep saying you're going. She goes, I need a morning appointment. I'm like, well, if you had said that, we would have scheduled a morning. So we did, and she did have the, col have the colonoscopy. Um, the other thing I had mentioned was difficulty getting mammograms and colorectal cancer screening reports. So we're using claims data now uh, to do that. Controlling hypertension. Um, again, we are below the baseline. This is a little tough because the way this is measured is that it's the last blood pressure reading of the year. So, you know, if the patient has been controlled all year and that particular day they came, they were either stressed out or had coffee, etc., and then the pressure, is, uh, the blood pressure is high, then they, they don't meet the criteria. So we're learning to take the blood pressure sort of at the end, um, at the end of the visit. So the baseline for December 2018 was 88%. Target is 75%. We're currently at 61, so we're a little low. Um, medic medical assistance or providers take the blood pressure of the patients. Um, the medication is suggested if needed and is discussed with the patient. Anybody now with elevated blood pressure of 140 over 90 um, or who started on new medication or has medication adjusted are given follow-up appointments with either RN or clinical form Ds who we have in the practice or providers. So some of the challenges this year was the ARP recall. So a lot of patients just stopped their losartan, stopped their losartan because of what they had heard on the news. So it's become a little difficult in terms of, you know, we are either having to change the medications or convincing them that these medications are now safe and, and they can start taking them again. Education of the MEs on how to take blood pressure collect the turnover again of the providers and MA of the practices. So the new providers and MEs have been educated on intervention, and again, standardization of trading of MEs across the practices. So the last two um, come under our diabetic care, so chronic disease management. So um, the top graph is for diabetic patients with nephropathy, and then the next one is diabetic patients with poor control, which is A1C is greater than 9. So for nephropathy screening, we're testing ages 18 to 75, Baseline in December was 90%. The target rate is 89. We are above the goal this year, 92.9% already. So again, educating providers on what the nephropathy screening guidelines are for diabetic patients and medical management. MEs are pending the microalbumin test orders during pre-visit planning or at the office visit. And we are now adding uh, patients who are on ARBs and AIDS to the numerator. So some of the challenges, again, are um, the guidelines, making sure people are... Um, screening according to the guidelines, turnover again, um, and educating the new providers. And sometimes when the patients come into the practice, they can't give the urine sample or they refuse to give the urine sample. So trying to follow up with them to get these tests done. So last but not the least um, is the poor control of diabetics. Um, so basically we're looking at diabetic patients who have A1Cs greater than nine, and we look at ages 18 to 75. So baseline, December 2018, uh, we are, we're at 19.5%. Um, our target rate is less than 21. So this is kind of the weird one where you actually have to be below the target rate. Currently, we are at a 16.6% as of November 2019. So our current di total diabetic population across the practices is 3,335. And we have about 554 patients who are above the A1C of 9. So this has been actually one of our very um, involved projects, and it's actually being run by a clinical farm D who is also a certified diabetic educator. So we started the intervention in December of 2017, um, and as I said, Deborah Whitman, who's a clinical farm D, led this as part of our district uh, project. So we developed multidisciplinary teams in collaboration with um, endocrine and the CDEs. So pretty much primary care was divided into teams. So you had a, a provider's team, and then you had a CDE assigned to your team, and you also had an endocrinologist assigned to your team. We had bi-monthly meetings to develop epic templates and workflows. Um, we assigned CDEs 
to review PCP monthly panel reports from EPIC. And what they do is they identify who's a high risk. So high risk, basically anybody greater than nine who can be managed by the CD in the primary care office. So we have two CDs in the primary care office. Um, one is a clinical pharmacy and one is a nutritionist. And then highest risk patients, so like patients who have um, who are on dialysis or type 1 diabetic have to be sent to the endocrine clinic, so they are managed by the CD in the endocrine clinic. So the CD basically goes through this process, creates a referral request, and uses the standardized template in EPIC, which is sent to the front desk to schedule appointments, either with the CD in the primary care practice or with the CD in endocrine. And then if the patient hasn't been seen in 12 to 18 months, the front desk will schedule an appointment with the provider. So embedding, I think, the CDs and primary care and endocrine practices really helped a lot in terms of improving our collaboration with endocrine and also access. So um, when we had the turnover of providers, if a patient has an A1C of greater than nine and there's no, the next appointment to see the providers in three months, they can actually see the CD who can continue to do management before they can get to the provider. Um, we also have developed training models for the practice staff, and those will be available in 2020. So some of the challenges, and I would say lessons learned, was that it's been very time. It was we initially started with the provider meeting, meeting with the CDE every month, and what we discovered was that it was very time consuming for the providers. Um, so we switched it over to the CDE just reviewed in the provider panel. There's an increase in the front desk workload because now they have to make the appointments, they have to call the patients who haven't been seen in a while. Um, we had turnover of front desk, MAs, and providers at the staff, so we're engaging the new staff and uh, new providers. Difficulty contacting patients, no-shows um, due to other socioeconomic determinants, and then patients who are no longer part of the practice still have the providers as their PCPs on the insurance card. So even though they are no longer seeing us, they are still sort of under us. So we are sort of figuring ways and um, how to get them sort of off, off that panel. So this is data from last year, January to December 2018. So as you can see, we initially started with a group of 690 patients, 347 received panel management by the CDE, 80 were lost to follow up. They either just stopped coming, they didn't come in and get their um, A1Cs done, or they switched over providers. And 30 were found to basically uh, not be eligible. So basically, again, they switched providers, they changed insurance, etc. So at the end of the initial 690, um, 237 were current and part of the intervention group. So out of the 237, 46%. Um, achieved an A1C of less than 9, and out of that 46%, 27.4% were managed by the CDE embedded in the primary care practice. That's where we had most of our success. 14% um, were achieved by the CDE in the um, endocrine practice, 3.7% just with endocrine, and then 0.8% just with primary care. So I think this slide is effectively showing that management um, with a CDE does um, help. Um, so this is what is looking like over the past three years. So we started at uh, quarter four, 2016, with 20.3% um, of our patients with an A1C greater than nine. Um, as of quarter four, November 2019, we only have 16.6% of patients um, greater than nine. And I'm pushing to have this written up somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So some of the lessons learned overall from our QI project uh, that multidisciplinary based care and engagement is, I, for me, very essential and I think a cornerstone of our QI projects. I think we all have to feel like we own a piece of it, and I think that's when it works well. Defining roles and expectations for the team members is important. Continuous education and engagement of all team members, including patients, is very important. And I think enhancing the primary care multidisciplinary teams with the additions of NPs, RNs, social workers, CDEs, clinical pharmacy has really made a difference and has given us a very robust um, group. And, and I think this is sort of an exciting time for us, you know, especially looking in 2020 of some of the projects we can do and some of the things we can continue to do. Empowering our medical assistance is very important. So we are standardizing training for all the medical assistance across the primary care practices. 
and then continuing to collaborate with other divisions, so division of endocrine, division of GI, and possibly maybe division of renal as we continue to work on uh, hypertension. Um, IT support, so as I mentioned, we're getting data from scorecards, we're getting huddle sheets, we're getting care gap reports. So trying to consolidate eventually all of that into one report will help, correcting any data discrepancies and continuing to develop epic templates to structure and standardize our process and interventions. So some of our future opportunities are continuing to work with our multidisciplinary teams, using our data effectively to determine further interventions needed to improve patient outcomes, consolidating the reports into one would help. Um, we are looking at a pilot to add a huddle sheet as a best practice alert in EPIC, um, needing some a lot of time for QI projects, and again, continuous engagement um, and education of all team members. So um, this is special thanks to all in primary care who've been part of this. Okay, so we're happy to entertain questions for anyone. Thanks so much for the presentation. It's just uh, it's great. So I enjoyed your presentations. My question is with respect to the last project you presented, uh, where you were recommending that CPCs and M7 or 20 were reduced in the observation. Um, no, we haven't looked into that. We just look. I mean, this is. We just looked at the orders. Um, we really didn't look at um, the cost or how it affected patient safety. But that's something that we would want to look into, definitely. Uh, thank you both for really great presentations. An amazing amount of work. So just really thank you very much. Um, Shantiri, for you, just so you know, I don't think I've prescribed Colase once <laughs> since you and, and Grace Ferris may be aware that it didn't work. And then the other piece of it, at home we have like this Tupperware box with our like family beds, and no less than every three years I go through it. And I was going through it fairly recently, I found all this Colase. <laughs> Um, but my question is really for you and also for Amy. I have a question for Nabi as well. In terms of the safety net, what are your thoughts about how to bring that to the outpatient? And Nabi, I guess for you also, how to bring that to the outpatient setting? Because I was struck by the one piece from the Institute of Medicine, and, you know, one out of 131 deaths are outpatient-related medication errors. And just in thoughts about that, I would appreciate. And then separately for Nabi, um, you know, really great work. And um, just in terms of the diabetes, you know, what do you think is realistic for that 237? You know, where is that cutoff point where we say, you know, it's not, because it's clearly we can't get to 0%, but really what makes sense to you as a provider and also as a quality champion? Um, I think that's a great question regarding bringing it to outpatient um, setting. In fact, um, last week we had a patient was readmitted because of a medication error that happened at the nursing home, but maybe we could have done better when the patient was discharged. Um, I mean, for our patient, I think Nabia can, uh, can fill in, but most important is educating providers, you know, because our house staff rotates in the outpatient clinics too, and a lot of them do follow up with at the, at the Ryan Center clinics um, to report them. If you see that there is an error in prescribing on this chart, or if you see there's an error from, you know, even the way the patient was taking its medication to basically educate people to, um, to report, I think, would be a good. And, you know, now that um, Quantify has been sunset and we're moving towards safety net, maybe we can redesign the project to do something with the outpatient and the outpatient. Uh, a couple of things. I wondered if there are any way to capture when patients get medications from more than one source, and how to reconcile that. Uh, an example, a patient was on a beta blocker from the internist, and the cardiologist prescribed a different beta blocker. So the patient passed out, got admitted to the hospital, because she didn't realize she was taking two beta blockers, but they're from two different places and two different institutions. So 
how do you capture that information and try to reconcile that? Because that's clearly an outpatient error, but you know, we wound up getting a hit because the patient wound up in our ED, even though the medications were given in two different places. So part of medication reconciliation is is capturing that. The other is uh, reducing diabetes uh, A1C below nine requires not just the what it seems to be reducing the number. The requirement is incredible amount of patient change in behavior. So I'm wondering how that you accomplish it, and then um, and the time involved. We for hire all these people to do all these things, but there's a cost related to that too. And is the cost then um, improved by outcomes, not in the one year time of interval, but really what's happening to the to the lives in the M and M following? <laughs> okay, so for I'll take now I'm even confused. So um, safety net, we're going to educate uh, providers um, in the outpatient setting to do that. Um, and then you had another question. I think. What do you think that percentage? Percentage. So probably ten, maybe ten to fifteen percent. I don't think we're going to get much lower than that. And especially for the elderly, we don't want them as tightly controlled. So probably about I think we are almost there, about fifteen percent. And then I think the question would be maintaining, you know, where we are. Because a lot of patients have A1Cs less than nine, and then three months or six months later, they go up again. So it's, con it's constantly just trying to maintain. But I think about 15%. I don't think we probably would get much lower than 15%. So Dr. Braun, in terms of medication reconciliation, there is the red hyperlink in EPIC. If the pharmacies feed into EPIC, um, the problem is that if the patient is not um, getting medications from a pharmacy that will feed into your electronic system, then it's a, a little difficult to figure out who gave what. But most of the time in medication reconciliation in EPIC, there is a red hyperlink, and if you click onto it, it takes you to a section where you can see all the medications that have come from different pharmacies and have also come from different providers. And that's something, you know, we need to be looking at when we are reconciling medications when patients come in. In terms of diabetes, um, it's, it's a lot of work, you're right. It's, you know, there's socioeconomic um, issues or determinants, there's diets, um, there's medication, and that is where the uh, certified diabetic educators, the clinical farm, and as I said, we also have a nutritionist. So that's where we are all collaborating with them in terms of looking at the different aspects of, of the patient's life and not just sort of the medication management, but what are you eating, you know, what is somebody else eating, you know, and, and thinking about it in terms of the lifestyle, you know, are you exercising, all, all that stuff. So it's a little, you're right, it's a little more complicated, but I think adding these different resources into primary care has helped us in terms of looking at this as a collaborative effort. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, just to follow up on the med rec. Uh, so Norman, it's absolutely an epic. But I think, you know, maybe your point in a way is finding the time to actually do that. And I'll just speak personally. I often don't notice that there's other drugs still pretty late in my documentation. And I'll not infrequently just feel like I don't have time. Or I'll have this feeling of feeling overwhelmed <laughs> with that additional information. But I think Epic's pretty, pretty robust as far as that goes. I think Epic, if you're the order. to sign that order, it asks you, do you want to put this patient on another rate of block? But if you're not the ordering provider, how do you got to do that med rack? Yeah. And, and then you get your med rack in somebody else's stuff. Yes. But it's, at least it's there, which I find is, is helpful. It wasn't, it wasn't very since, since there's finally people here knowledgeable about that, I've been looking for that function where you can pull all the outside meds on the inpatient side, and I haven't been able to find it. So does anyone know that you can see that on the inpatient side? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a red link, and it says... Uh, You're going to show me. Yes, yeah, no, I'll show you. <laughs> no one's available to tell me. You can import these... Uh, 
the outside meds too. When you're doing the medical reconciliation, when you're admitting a patient, um, it actually pops up on the right side saying that there are some medications that you need to relieve mm -hmm. from other sources. There's a thing. So that like the early field? If you don't look look at them, you don't see it in subsequent fields? Um, yes, unfortunately. It is on the admission part. Okay. And you need to click there, and there are, you'll have 15 different kinds of blockers on there, so you have to selectively move them into your active method for that patient. So it is time consuming. It's, uh, it takes more than just five minutes. Yeah. Uh, I recently, I don't know, you know, I, uh, some insurance companies have started to send you letters when they do do medication reconciliation on their own. I received a letter about one of my patients on medications that did not go together. So I think that was also quite helpful because you said it's very time consuming to Thank you very much.